This is a special sort of Myth Pilgrim episode. Rather than immediately diving into the story or themes of Harry Potter, this episode aims to firstly explore the concerns some Christians have expressed about Harry Potter itself. Since its release, not a few voices have suggested that the story normalises alleged occult and pagan practices in the form of a popular children's story. Among this group would be school principals, parents, and even a Vatican exorcist. (laughs) If this is your current concern, and you've thus far avoided Harry Potter, ah, this episode is for you. Or, if you have seen or read Harry Potter and enjoy them, and want to know how to talk about these very real issues with people concerned with the story, this episode is for you too. Also, just before we dig in, you may be interested to know that the content of this episode has largely been informed by a survey I did of 25 respected church leaders, including parents, priests, and primary school teachers. If you're one of those and are listening now to this episode, thank you for your input. The participants of this survey comprised of some people completely opposed to Harry Potter, some who were sort of more or less neutral to it, and others still who love it. Of course, my own voice and opinion will be in the mix too this episode, the perks of being the presenter, but yeah, I wanted to let you know that much prayer and preparation has gone into preparing this episode. I just said preparing twice. Anyway, let's begin. You're listening to The Myth Pilgrim, and I am Brother Lawrence of the Missionaries of God's Love. At its heart, the spiritual journey is a delightful and perilous adventure, just like the myths and fairy tales we love. This podcast is also a journey, learning from both wizards and saints, enchanted princesses and inner demons. Together, we'll discover how the great symbols of myth and fairy tale can guide us on our spiritual journey to God. The fact that Harry Potter is a cultural phenomenon is without a doubt. Almost every one of my friends in the early 2000s have read the seven books or at least seen some of the movies. It is clear that something about the story has universal appeal, regardless of culture, given the fact Harry Potter is not just a Western phenomenon, but truly global. This fact alone deserves attention from a Catholic standpoint, for we should at least be asking, what universal desires and hopes has Harry Potter tapped into? Where might the Gospel meet these same desires, or more importantly, where has the Gospel failed to meet these desires. Further, the word Catholic means of the whole or part of the whole. And for Catholics, art, beauty and story have historically been means of encountering God too and bringing others to the faith. However, rightfully or not, since the first few books were released, Christians alarmed with the alleged occult content have dominated any cultural conversation around Harry Potter. The effect of this is that such voices have created a particular lens in which most Christians now engage with the themes. This episode is about recognising this lens, but then to expand it. Content-wise, I will firstly begin by discussing how Christians can discern the magic and occult content in secular stories in general. I will then explore some rumours and myths uh, floating about about Harry Potter and its author, um, J.K. Rowling, so as to divide fact from fiction. I will then move into a segment which discusses the important topic of spiritual discernment, presenting it as the forgotten tool for us Christians to use in order to decide what content is actually suitable for consumption, Harry Potter or otherwise. Finally, based on the responses in the survey, I will share a few considerations for parents to help them discern the suitability for their children, stories that contain magic and spells, etc., etc., Okay, all of that sounds quite ambitious and scary. It is. <laughs> but that's a bit of a roadmap for this episode, and I will do my best to stick to it. The occult is, of course, real. If we take occult practices to mean the contact with, the interest in, or the worship of spiritual forces and agents other than God and his angels, every Christian must renounce this hands down. The scriptures clearly teach that occult practices are a direct violation against God and not least the first commandment. Further, we know the enemy, the devil, is the angel of light and works by seduction. He is intelligent and weaves lives with half-truths. Hence, if ever anything occult is normalised or presented as desirable in our fiction or movies or games, it should be condemned by the church. However, I will at this point posit that the most popular book in the world that contains explicit details of the occult is actually the Bible. In it, we have accounts of Israelite kings consulting with the dead, 
preachers practicing witchcraft, and even astrologers following a star to find the Messiah. Okay, I'm being a little bit cheeky here, though the point I am making needs to be made. Just because a book or a movie or story contains elements of the occult, doesn't automatically rule out the piece of work morally. For if we follow this logic, we would also rule out the Bible, along with the works of many desert fathers and saints who plainly speak of the devil and possessions, etc., etc. Okay, so there's a very basic foundation we can all hopefully agree on. <laughs> Let's nuance it a little bit more then. We should then ask, how? Is the so-called occult elements presented in the work? Is it presented as good or evil, desirable or undesirable? Clearly, back to the Bible, the occult is presented as morally sinful, opposite to God's spirit and His truth. So the Bible's okay in that regard. Regarding the Harry Potter question, though, you may be interested to know that in context, two other great works of Christian fiction have also raised alarm bells when they were first published. C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. And J. R. R. Tolkien's *The Lord of the Rings*. Narnia has an abundance of magic and ghouls and demons and curses, let alone quasi-racist depictions of the bad guys and bloody violence such as beheadings. And then in *The Lord of the Rings*, you have enchantments and incantations and a host of devilish enemies and a demonically infested ring as one of the main characters that seeks to corrupt anyone who wears it. Yet you hardly find a single credible Christian today condemning these books. What makes the difference? Certainly, the knowledge that both C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien are both strong, passionate, active Christians has helped their cause. But how do these famous stories measure up with the modern Harry Potter? Well, I'm going to present one important response that came through in my survey. Readers are not fans of Harry Potter because of its magic and wizardry and spells, any more than people are fans of the Lord of the Rings because of elven magic and Sauron's infested ring. Wizardry is a story device, but it is certainly not the chief reason I enjoyed Harry Potter. Rather, I enjoyed the stories as a thirteen-year-old for what it stirred up within me—a desire to exhibit the same virtues as the heroes. I wanted to be brave like Harry, to be loyal like Sirius, to be prudent like Dumbledore, and to be selfless like Snape. I pondered the mystery of how a parent's self-sacrificing love for their infant could actually disarm evil incarnate. You may be interested to know that of the people who had read Harry Potter and completed that survey, pretty much all of them wrote as their chief reasons for enjoying Harry Potter some variation of: a, I like Harry Potter because it demonstrates how love conquers evil and how love is the strongest spell of all; and b, that there is still a clear difference between good and evil, and while it's often not obvious for the characters caught up in it all, we must all choose which side to stand on. Given such a quasi-Christian moral framework, what has Harry Potter got working against it? Firstly, there is that rumor that author J.K. Rowling is actually a witch herself and once practiced Wicca. Okay, now this rumor is so far-fetched that even trolling through many apparent sources on the internet have revealed only scanty speculation, and only from people who already had an issue with the stories. On the contrary, Rowling herself has professed numerous times she is a Christian, and was the only practicing Christian growing up in a family to attend the local Church of Scotland services. And she even baptized her own daughter, Jessica. Unlike authors C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, Rowling didn't reveal her Christian faith initially, but she also explains why, saying that if people knew she was Christian, they would probably guess the grand finale of the Harry Potter saga, in which Harry Potter pretty much does a Jesus Christ. Absorbing evil onto himself as a living sacrifice, dying and resurrecting, at a place cleverly chosen to be King's Cross Station, the name of course deriving from the cross of Christ, the King of Kings. This is why she only revealed she was a Christian on the release of Book Seven, the final book. Sure, like all of us, she struggles with some components of the faith, but this is far from concluding that she is therefore a witch incarnate. When asked if she were a Christian by the Vancouver Times, she said, "Yes, I am," which seems to offend the religious right far worse than if I said that there was no God. Every time I've been asked if I believe in God, I've said yes because I do, but no one really has gone any more deeply into it than that. And I have to say that does suit me because if I talk too freely about it, then I think the intelligent reader, whether they're ten or sixty, will be able to guess what's coming in the books. 
if Jackie and Rowling really were a witch, were they packed with some no good spirit, would she really write a book in which love conquers evil, in which Christian virtues are upheld, in which functional nuclear families are promoted, and a sacramental worldview is celebrated? Would the big bad evil really be called Voldemort, meaning he who flees death, while Harry, the hero of the story, embraces death like Christ? Perhaps some added perspective is needed regarding conclusions drawn about author J.K. Rowling. Another rumour about Harry Potter that is unhelpful is that the spells are real incantations taken from real occult manuals. This concern came up in the survey a number of times. I do believe one unfortunate thing Harry Potter has against it is the word witchcraft in the name of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. I do believe if Rowling had chosen another name for the school, like Hogwarts School of Enchantments or even Hogwarts School of Magic, it would have been less of a trigger word. Having said that, let's look at this rumour that real spells are being used and written into Harry Potter. This is, again, simply not true. Almost humorously not true. Rowling and any linguist worth their salt can trace the words of the spells used as a play on English and Latin words, such as the spell Lumos, which is a play on the Latin word Lumen, which you probably know means light. Expelliarmus, a spell to disarm your opponent's wand, comes from combining the English words expel and arms. And Wingardium Leviosa, a spell which makes things float, comes from combining the word wing, the English word wing, the Latin words ardus, meaning steep, and levi, which means to lift. Other popular spells like ridiculous, stupefy, and confundo are so obvious in their play in English words that they are just plain fun. Ah, but what about the dark, unspeakable spells, the ones that only the evil guys mutter, of which Rowling tells us there are only three? Well, crucio is simply Latin for the word torture. Evada cadavra is a play on abracadabra, which itself comes from the Aramaic word meaning let the thing be destroyed, and imperious simply means I govern. If these words bear any resemblance to serious real-life incantations, I believe it is purely incidental and not intentional. Add to the fact most of the words are a play on language anyway and therefore made up. However, you may still be asking at this point, would a story that features spells in itself encourage a child's interest in the real-life occult? A good question, and I promise I will address it later. But one final objection against Harry Potter often raised by Catholics. A few spokesmen within the church have spoken out against Harry Potter, most noticeably Father Gabriel Amorth, who was once the Vatican's chief exorcist. He said, quote, In Harry Potter, the devil acts in a crafty and covert manner under the guise of extraordinary powers, magic spells, and curses. End quote. That sounds pretty serious, coming from someone who knows the seductive power of occult spirits. Well, how should we receive his words? Consider that Father Gabriel Amorth is speaking with the lens of a Catholic exorcist, in which he is rightfully sensitive and explicit about the workings of the enemy. To this degree, we should discern his authority on those grounds. But Father Gabriel is not an authority on literature, on culture, or even on parenting. Remember, the word Catholic means part of the whole. We must weigh up Father Gabriel's words along with other voices within the church, many of which have been in support of the books, not least people like Cardinal George Pell and Father Peter Fleetwood from the Vatican's Council for Culture. But which voice carries the most authority? Well, all of them, to the degree their individual positions are relevant for your current spiritual situation. Because the thing is, there's a good reason why the Catholic Church still actually doesn't have an official stance on Harry Potter, any more than the Church has a stance on Marvel movies or Star Wars or video games. Because culture is contextual, and the morality of content is often dependent on so many things like a person's age, their emotional sensitivity, their gender, their cultural upbringing. Let's not forget, the ultimate voice of authority that Christian is called to listen to is actually the Holy Spirit, who speaks within us. To actively discern the spiritual benefits of any content we consume, Harry Potter or otherwise, is the task of each individual, and it is to this principle that we now turn. I will posit up front that if a child, having read Harry Potter, develops an interest in the real-life occult, 
and there is in your judgment a direct causal link between the books and their interest in the occult, then this story is not for them. If there are scenes and imagery that disturbs and frightens them, then this story is perhaps not for them. It is also clear that if in your prudential judgment you feel that any book or story or song or art is pulling you away from the things of God and more towards earthly things like power and wealth and lust and wrath, then this is also grounds to discontinue. For St. Ignatius of Loyola cautions us that the bad spirit is always drawing us away from God and the things of God. You will recognize the bad spirit at work because he will always lead you to feel a decrease in the virtues of faith, hope and love and fill you instead with despair and anxiety and confusion. This, however, has not at all been my experience of the Harry Potter stories and, from what I've gathered, not the experience of an overwhelming amount of its readers. Let me put flesh on this. If, having read the Harry Potter books, you feel more drawn towards the things of God, then this is the sign of the good spirit working. What do I mean by the things of God? Well, just as Ignatius gave us a description of the bad spirit, he also gave us a description of the good spirit. If in watching or reading Harry Potter, you feel in your soul an increase in faith, hope and love, then this is a sign of the good spirit working. If you feel that you want to grow in virtue, to be heroic, self-sacrificial, loyal and honest, this is also a movement of the good spirit. Further, I would even say if you feel a desire and attraction for the virtuous magic in Harry Potter, for example like the protective Patronus charms, then this too is also a good desire. For Christians should be drawn to virtuous spiritual realities, for we are a faith that professes a belief in the supernatural Holy Spirit, the intercession of the saints and the protection of our guardian angels. So let me ask, given the above descriptions, which movement of the Spirit do you feel is at work in you when you read or watch Harry Potter? Dear friends, noticing this is very important because the discernment of spirits is also the key to knowing the morality of us doing anything. Christians no longer subscribe to a mere sort of Old Testament spirituality governed by external rules and laws and opinions. Rather, we are chiefly people of the Holy Spirit who imparts His law inside our hearts. The Spirit will lead everyone differently, even over the same content, so we must take the step of discernment seriously. But what about if you're a parent and you can't necessarily jump inside the skin of your child to know which spirit is predominantly working? Glad you asked. First of all, it's helpful to avoid snap judgment based on what you hear from others. Certainly, take heed of different opinions by all means and listen to other people's advice. But unless, in your opinion, a story directly violates the scriptures, through, for example, the glorification of violence, sex and human dysfunction, it shouldn't, in my opinion, be automatically ruled out. When it comes to books and movies aimed at younger audiences, it may be very revealing to ask your child about their experience. What are they drawn to? What does the books make them want to do? How does it change the way they want to act? Who's their favourite character and why? Of course, reading and watching something like Harry Potter yourself will provide incredible data for parental discernment. Or even better, watching them with your children and discussing it after. This aside, here are three more considerations drawn from the survey to aid parents in deciding the suitability of something like Harry Potter or any story containing magical elements. Firstly, is the magic a natural part of the fictional world or something that is esoteric to be sought after in secret for private ends? If you feel a story is leaning more towards the latter, I argue that this may present a slightly higher risk for some children translating the character's access to magic into real-life experimentation. However, I do not think this to be the case in Harry Potter, for the setting is indeed naturally magical. And once the characters go through platform nine and three quarters, magic is in the DNA of the world. Hence, the use of magic in the Harry Potter world context will be no different from a Jedi using his force powers in a galaxy far, far away. The supernatural becomes part of the natural order, and the audience, no matter how young, by instinct knows this. Also, remember that to be authentically Christian is to be supernatural. For us to deny the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit and the saints and the kingdom of God makes us little more like muggles in Harry Potter, barely worth a mention in the grand story, and impotent before the real powers of darkness at work in our midst. 
The second consideration I would posit is something like this. There is a distinction between the use of magical powers, for example, Elsa in Disney's Frozen, and the consulting and channeling of spirits. The strict Catholic ban on the occult is actually less about the powers it appears to accrue and more about something much more serious. Idolatry, the entering into a relationship with the demonic and other spirits hostile to God and the soul. Hence, I would be more than a little concerned if a story or a fairy tale pivoted around a character contacting some dodgy spirit or seer in order to obtain even a noble end. But again, I don't see this in Harry Potter. The magic Harry partakes in is part of the natural order of his fictional world, and by no means the channeling of some foreign spirit. The third consideration I would posit is this. If dark magic is present in the story, example through curses and hexes, who uses them? Is such a feat celebrated in the story? What message would children walk away with? It is clear in Harry Potter that spells such as the three unforgivable curses are not celebrated and are clearly the weapons of Voldemort and his evil minions. Yet, after his godfather, Sirius, was murdered point blank, Harry suddenly tries to perform a Crucio curse to stop Bellatrix Lestrange. But in this scene, Rowling is trying to illustrate the knife-edge volatility of Harry's mission, rather than prove a, pro- a compromise of his character. I feel Harry's Crucio spell is not any more morally compromising than Frodo Baggins falling numerous times under the temptation of the ring. Do we reduce Frodo's character to his moment of weakness and invalidate the entire work of the Lord of the Rings? Or do we, as mentioned earlier, try and see the story's manifest evil in the context of the greater values and message of the story? Incidentally, Harry fails the Crucio curse because Bellatrix tells him he doesn't have enough hatred. (laughs) Go figure. Anyway, what is clear to me is that in Harry Potter, the weapon of choice against dark magic is not stronger dark magic or even stronger light magic, but rather love. A willingness to lay down one's life for others. And in my humble opinion, you'll be hard-pressed to find another popular work of fiction today where the protagonist rises to such clear Christian virtues. Whew, okay. In summary, how do I summarise this episode? Let me try and do so in four main points. Firstly, the realm of the occult is real, and it should be a concern if young people are drawn away from God by any work of fiction. However, just because a story contains alleged occult elements doesn't necessarily make it immoral, any more than the Bible should be considered immoral. The story's context, intention and the overarching values need to be considered. Secondly, Christians discussing Harry Potter today should not reduce it to the whole occult debate. As Christians, I feel it will be a lot more fruitful to firstly inquire about the desires and thoughts and emotions the books stir up within readers, and to see whether these are compatible with Christian values. Thirdly, know the facts rather than the rumours about Harry Potter. While Christians should weigh up the opinions from church authorities, the greatest tool a mature Christian has is spiritual discernment. If, after watching or reading Harry Potter, a person feels drawn down towards earthly or even evil things, this is a clear movement of the bad spirit and should be discontinued. If, however, after reading something like Harry Potter, a person feels an increase in faith, hope and love, and the desire to aspire to greater Christian virtue, then this is a movement of the good spirit and should be celebrated. Fourthly, I shared a number of ways for parents to help discern whether fiction with magical elements is appropriate for their children. Because we're going way over time already, we probably won't have time to summarise those here, but I will make available the transcript of this entire episode on the Myth Pilgrim website, in case you find it more helpful to read the content there. But I do hope and really pray that this episode has been helpful in some way to you, and do please share this resource with your family and friends who you think may benefit from it. Thanks for staying with me on this longer than usual episode, and until next time, journey forth, take care, and God bless. God bless.